I wanted to share a little story um, about how I came to know you uh, with the audience. So about three years ago, I signed up for a workshop at the Esalen Institute, and I thought, oh, internal family systems, this is interesting, okay. There's a family inside me. All right, let's figure what this, uh, this is. And what I did not realize is that my heart would be blown open that weekend and that I would get in contact with parts of me I didn't know were there. And I walked away with not only loving myself, but also uh, a capacity to receive love. So thank you, because shortly thereafter, uh, my friendship with Soren transformed into a beloved wow. soulmate relationship. Wow. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. It's, uh, it's a thrill to be here again this year and to be with you, Liz. And I'm moved by that story. And I wish I can guarantee anybody who tried this would find a Soren, but... Um, <laughs> But I can say, I'll guarantee anybody who tries this will have more of an open heart, so, yeah. Yes. So if you could just tell us an overview in your words. Uh, what is IFS? Yeah, I don't have a great elevator speech, but yeah. uh, it's a way, so first of all, basic idea is that we're all multiple personalities, that people with that diagnosis aren't so different from all the rest of us, except that their systems got really blown apart by the horrific trauma they suffered. <clears throat> but we're all on a spectrum like that, and that, as, uh, uh, the, as in the introduction, in addition to all these parts, lies what I call the self, which has been a kind of a theme this week. Um, you know, Dan started out by talking about this plane of possibilities. Uh, Katie today was talking about, I think it was um, your true nature. And in their language, they're talking about basically the same thing I'm talking about, that there is this undamaged essence in all human beings that has compassion naturally. So it isn't a muscle you have to build up through a lot of practice, but that as we go through life, the slings and arrows have a way of forcing these parts out of their naturally valuable states into mm -hmm. protective roles that can close our hearts. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the work is designed to help find the parts that are obscuring the self and help them trust it's safe to open space for it. So you can lead both your external life from this place. The other thing I found is as these parts are, start to trust that yeah. and self emerges, it's like this new person comes out and knows how to heal these parts. It actually takes over sessions and starts to do this internal work uh, of actually listening with respect to parts that had plagued them all their lives. Or part, you know, we do this with virtually every diagnosis now, and I consulted, for example, for seven years to a sex offender treatment center. Mm -hmm. And if approached from this mindful, open-hearted, open-minded place, even the parts that have molested little kids will tell their secret histories of how they got forced into these roles. So the one basic conviction is that, again, we're all multiple personalities. I've got them, you've all got them. Um, they're all valuable. There aren't any bad ones. I'm sort of the Will Rogers of the phenomena. I've never met a part that ultimately I didn't like. And that they need more access to this self because they lose trust in its leadership when bad things happen to you. Mm. So how, you mentioned there's parts and there's different types of parts. Can you share a little bit about what the different pites, parts are? Um, what we find is that it isn't so much the different kinds of parts as the common roles they get forced into. So yeah. when you get hurt, especially as a child, the most sensitive parts of you are the ones that take it most personally and carry thereafter what we'll call the burden of worthlessness or the burden of terror or the burden of, of some kind of emotional pain, rejection, and loneliness. They get frozen in time back there. They still live as if you're three or four years old. Mm -hmm. And because now what was a delightful, energetic, childlike part of you that 
that gave you awe and uh, wanted to connect with people and gave you creativity is hurt, you tend to lock it away in what we call exile it. Mm -hmm. And once you get a bunch of these exiles, because you don't know it's a part, you just think it's a bunch of pain or shame or, or terror. And then once you get a bunch of these exiles, life is much more dangerous and you have to have a bunch of protective parts who are forced into roles to protect you. So the main distinction is between protectors and exiles, but once they're released from these roles, they transform into their naturally valuable states. Mm -hmm. And you can't predict that by the role they're in. Mm -hmm. Dan Siegel said the self is a plural noun on Thursday. So right. how do you see that? Yeah, Dan has a kind of allergy to uh, the word self. So <laughs> we were talking about the same territory. I call that the self because when I would get clients in that state, yeah. I would say, now, what part of you is that? And they'd say, that's not a part, really. That's more me, my self, my true self, my core self. So I call that self with a capital A, S, yeah. to distinguish it from the common usage of the word self, which is the whole person, basically. Which, in all of that, I agree with Dan. One of the, the qualities that emerges spontaneously when you access this is connectedness. So I totally agree. We just have a, a linguistic difference, mm. yeah. So how would I know if I'm in self? Well, um, I'm looking at the time. There's an exercise we could do yeah. to get you there. Um, I'm just debating which way, way to go with this. You know it because, like, when I'm sitting here, I'm monitoring several things at the same time. Yeah. I'm noticing how open my heart is. I'm noticing how much of the energy that the Qigong master was talking about uh, is running through my body. Because when you're in self, it just automatically happens. I'm noticing if I have a big agenda or not. Yeah. Uh, so I'm monitoring all that at the same time, and if I feel departures from those things, automatically I assume, okay, there's a part that's come in. Yeah. So I had to do a little work with my parts earlier <laughs> to get up on stage here. Um, and they're doing fine. They're really leaving me alone and trusting me right, right now. You know, some of them will have a fit afterwards that I drag them up here. But, <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm feeling good. Yeah, so... Uh, so anyway, that's how we can tell, and yeah. we have a lot of exercises designed to, to know parts from self. And one of the points I want to make here is because so many people are interested in, uh, in self-compassion training and so on, and, and trying to bring in these skills. And uh, so I don't know if you know the name Tanya Singer, but she's a compassion researcher, mm -hmm. very, uh, very skilled one. Yeah. And she did a big study recently completed, had three conditions. One was mindfulness, another was self-compassion, and then the third was based on my work, where people identified parts and talked to each other about their parts. And one of the things that interested me was, she said, in the, in the self-compassion condition, over a third of the people couldn't do it, and many of them dropped out. Mm. And for me, that's because they have parts that think opening my heart is dangerous, and those parts are going to sabotage any kind of practice unless you actually work with them and help them with their fears. So part of my goal is to help mindfulness practitioners, other kinds of, this was a psychotherapy initially, yeah. just realize that they're simply noticing the parts that might be interfering, helping them trust it's safe to open space, listening to them, loving them with compassion, Mm -hmm. actually really facilitates your meditative practice. Do you and I see I've got this? about enough time to try something out. <laughs> we have time. Go mm -hmm. ahead. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you're interested, just take a second, get comfortable, put your stuff down. And I'm going to invite you to Focus on your heart in your chest, your physical heart. And we're just going to do a kind of scan of the state of your heart in this moment.
And in particular, I'm going to invite you to notice how closed it is right now as opposed to open. Or how crusted it is as opposed to tender. Or how congested it feels. Can energy flow through it, or are there places where it's clogged up? So we're just going to do this little survey, scan of your heart. You might find that it's different in different places. So maybe the front is closed, but the back is open. Or the top is crusted and the bottom is tender. Maybe energy can flow through some aspects of it, but not others. And if you do notice that in some places it's crusted or closed or congested, that means there's a protective part of you that's guarding it right there. And so focus on that exclusively for a second. As you notice that place in your heart, notice how you feel toward it. In other words, are you annoyed that it protects your heart? Do you have your fear of it? Do you feel dependent on it? So you have a relationship with this protective part of you. And if you feel any of those things, ask the other parts that don't like it or fear it to just relax a little bit and give you some space to just get to know this protective part of you. And do that until you feel at least curious about it. And if that doesn't happen, it just means these other parts aren't ready to separate. So you can ask them about that, what they're afraid would happen if they let you get to know this other one. But if you can get to that place of curiosity at least, then ask what this part wants you to know about itself and why it protects your heart. And don't think of the answer, just wait for an answer to come right from that place. And be patient if nothing comes.
And a good follow-up question is, ask this part what it's afraid would happen if it didn't do this to your heart. And if it answered that, you learn something about what it's protecting. And so if it feels right, see if you can extend it some appreciation for trying to keep your heart safe, even if it gets in your way. See if you can extend appreciation to this protective part of your heart and see how it reacts to your appreciation. And then ask it this, if you could heal the parts of you it protects in your heart, so your heart wasn't so vulnerable to being hurt, and this part was liberated from its protective role, what might it like to do instead inside of you with all that energy? And then the final question is, ask this part what it needs from you in the future. When that all feels complete, you can begin to shift your focus back out here and thank your parts for whatever they let you know, if they did. And uh, if it helps to come back to take deep breaths, then go ahead and do that, too. So, uh, yeah, so that's an example of just trying to find the protective parts that block our heart, at least block some of our heart's energy, and help them trust it's safe to keep our hearts open. Mm. And uh, that this self that we've all been talking about, which Katie was talking about how much power it has, actually, that they don't trust because it didn't protect you when you were a child. Mm. So the parts have learned that they have to be like parentified inner, inner children. Mm. That a lot of the work is just helping all those parts come to trust in self-leadership again, mm -hmm. both in the inner world and the outer world. So if this is going to be a daily practice, just like mindfulness or compassion, how would one use IFS? Yeah, so it's very compatible with mindfulness uh, with a couple tweaks. So ordinarily, you go inside, you notice your thoughts, emotions, sensations, and you separate from them, which accesses this self I'm talking about. But instead of considering them as only that, if you think of that as emanations from these parts, then there's a very simple next step, which is to focus on one and just ask these questions, ask some questions like that. 
and the answers you get back often will be very surprising. And then as you get to know the part, as I hope some of you found, you'll learn what it's trying to protect. You'll show it compassion. So it's this inner compassion, but at, directed at a specific place in your mind. It's not so general self-compassion kind of practice. Mm -hmm. Because what we're trying to bring is the same kind of internal compassion, peace, uh, that we hope to bring in the outside world. Because how you relate to these parts inside will very much dictate how you relate to people who resemble those parts in the outside world. Mm -hmm. And so if you're violent inside, you're going to be violent in the outside world. If you're scared of certain parts yeah. on the inside, you're going to be scared of those people. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm, I'm intrigued by the parallels and... Um, yeah. Yeah. And just in closing, where do you see this going? Just going to keep. As I it said, going. it began as a form of psychotherapy, yeah. and we've done pretty well in that realm. And uh, it seems to have a life of its own. So it's expanding into being a kind of daily practice, uh, sort of a spiritual practice, but also we're bringing it into mediation and conflict resolution and education and. Um, business, and so on and so on. So uh, it's, you know, I, when I stumbled onto this, I was 33, and I thought, Jesus, if this pans out, that everybody's <laughs> got this self, that would change everything. Yeah. I hope somebody comes along who can take it where it's supposed to go, because I'm just a little kid. But it turns out I'm the one I've been waiting for, so. Mm. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>